Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Larry Marnett, the Dean of the School of Medicine Basic Sciences, and uh, you are in the right place, which is our lab to table conversation on the science of flavors. We're going to wait about a minute uh, to let everybody come in and we'll get back to you and get started. All right, so people are joining us. I'm sure a few more will as we go on, but um, welcome again. As I said, I'm Larry Marnett, the Dean of the School of Medicine Basic Sciences at Vanderbilt, and it's my pleasure to join a panel of experts to discuss what we know about the science of flavor and its application. This is a topic that I've been interested in for quite a while, personally and professionally. For 14 years, I was a member of the expert panel of the Flavor and Extract Manufacturers Association, which is charged by the FDA with determining the safety of all components of flavor added to food. Today's event is hosted by the School of Medicine Basic Sciences as part of a monthly series called Lab to Table Conversations that connects biomedical research to real life topics. In fact, of the many of these events that we've held, today's might be the most appropriate to be called lab to table. The flavor has been a key component of human history, from the development of food cultures across the world, to the spice trade changing economies, and the way people cook and experience food, flavor has been a major driver of human experience. In fact, it has also been important for our evolution and survival in that flavor is essential to warning us of materials that are potentially dangerous. But what is flavor? Where does it come from? What is the scientific basis of flavor and how is it applied? Today, we're excited to delve into these questions with our panelists. Uh, one housekeeping note, if you've got a question, please place it in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. We've already received numerous questions during registration, and we'll be answering as many as we can at the end of the moderated discussion. Uh, I'm pleased to turn the conversation over to each of our panelists to introduce themselves. That's Sheldon Lee, Vivek Surti, and John York. So uh, Sheldon, why don't you go first? Thank you, Larry. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sheldon Lee. Um, my background is in neuroscience and the molecular biology. I started working in the industry uh, in 2000. Um, my first job was at a startup company called Synomics. Uh, at Synomics, we worked on molecular biology of human taste receptors. Uh, we basically used the pharma approach uh, to discover flavor molecules. Um, my second job uh, was 10 years at International Flavors and Fragrances where I was responsible for the new flavor ingredient development in the R&D department. Uh, right now, a couple of my former coworkers and I, we are working on a startup company called uh, Exora Scientific here in San Diego. So we are focusing on developing natural taste modulators, basically a specific type of flavor ingredient, mainly for the health and uh, well-being of consumers. Thanks, Sheldon. Uh, next, Vivek Sorti. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Vivek Sorti, um, executive chef and founder of Taylor, uh, which is a restaurant here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, the restaurant itself is a dinner party style restaurant uh, where we focus on making South Asian American food. Um, it's basically the food of a first generation American whose family comes from India. Uh, and we do it in a style where you get you know, it, you basically get everything on the menu. So it's anywhere between eight to 12 courses uh, throughout a night with little anecdotes in between um, that tell a story about um, the place that I grew up in, uh, the food that we ate growing up, um, about great producers and farmers and partners that we have um, here in the Nashville area and beyond. Um, and 
excited to join the conversation tonight, today. Thanks, Vivek. Uh, yeah. John York. Hi, everyone. Uh, John York. Um, I'm the chief science officer at Impossible Foods. Many of you may have heard of this company. It is a, a company that is really based on trying to uh, achieve enrichment of biodiversity and reduce the impact of um, the food industry on the planet. Uh, and, um, you know, I spent 30 years in academia and about a year ago uh, joined the company, but I thought I would give you just a little bit of a background of who I am. So back when I had hair, uh, you could tell from an early age that I loved chemistry and science. This is me making hydrogen gas in my parents' uh, basement. I uh, did have success there. I was very interested in nature. Um, I was a member of the Audubon Society and Banded Birds. This is a chipping sparrow in the um, uh, family room. Again, just parents probably didn't like it. And then, of course, I also loved cooking. So that's really one of the reasons why I made the jump from academia to Impossible Foods, because all three of these things really play a role in what I do today as the Chief Science Officer. Next slide. So I just thought I would tell you a little bit, Impossible is a mission-based company. Um, we are really concerned with the um, growing impact that animal-based um, food has on the planet. Um, there are, this is something that I learned uh, when I was interviewing for the position. There are 1.7 billion cows on the planet and the actual tonnage of cows actually uh, is more than the combined total of all natural animals and humans on the planet. This was as of 2019 and the problem just keeps getting um, more and more. And in order to sustain um, that amount of uh, cow, we actually use 45% of the non-frozen land mass of, of the United States to um, sustain the growth of that, that industry. And the next slide. And so our mission at Impossible, as I said, we're a mission-based company is to uh, restore glo global biodiversity and avert, avert the climate catastrophe by completely replacing the use of animals as a food technology by 2035. So the numbers below um, 10 to the 12th is the, is the amount of pounds that is uh, part of the animal-based industry, 1 trillion pounds. And we have about 10,000 fold way uh, more to go before we achieve these goals. So thanks everybody. I'm really honored to be here. I, I dined at Taylor. Um, it's great to meet um, Sheldon. And of course, having spent uh, 10 years at Vanderbilt, uh, I know Larry and Aaron very well and as well as Steven. So great to be here. <laughs> thanks everyone. As you can see, we've got a terrific panel today and I'm excited to get started. So uh, we'll begin by focusing on questions that we generated and that we've integrated with the questions that the audience submitted during registration. And we thought we ought to start with definitions. So uh, when we talk about flavor, what are we referring to? Uh, Sheldon, why don't we get started with you? Uh, sure. I, I will start with a narrower de definition of flavor. Uh, I think flavor is a group of chemicals that give you the perception of taste and smell of food product. And sometimes they can be used in other product also. So that's the narrow de definition. But uh, in addition to the chemicals that give uh, taste and uh, smell, the flavor industry also supply ingredients that improve the texture and the mouthfeel of food product. So those ingredients are often included in the definition of flavors as well. Okay, uh, Vivek, just a, a comment on the different types of tastes. Yeah, sure. Um, I think you, you know, your tongue tastes five things really. Um, sour, salty, sweet, bitter. Uh, and then, and those are kind of the common ones that everybody knows. And then there's a fifth one that's been a little bit more uh, recent, uh, which is umami or the or savory um, is really kind of how they describe it. Um, it's been something that's been prevalent in Japanese cuisine and Asian cuisine for a long time, um, but now is making its way uh, more into American cuisine. So, you know, as the rise of people think about things like soy sauce or mushrooms or tomato, these are ingredients that naturally uh, have umami or make your mouth water. Um, and I think flavor really is, uh, as Sheldon said, the combination of those tastes with aroma, with texture, with sight, with, with sound. Um, kind of encapsulating all the senses into it. So that's, that's a really interesting integration. So um, can we 
estimate how much of flavor is just taste or just aroma or can is that even valid? I mean, is, are they so tightly linked? I think, I think for different people, different things. Um, you know, I think that taste is always going to be there. Um, but sometimes the way that we, you know, when a dish is presented to you, if it's plated very beautifully, uh, that might have an impact on how, on how the flavor of that comes in. Uh, if it's something that smells really great um, and starts making your mouth water, that will have an impact on it. Um, you know, I think like, uh, even when I was a kid, we would go to all these Mexican restaurants and my parents would order fajitas. Um, and when they bring it out on that sizzle platter, uh, you're hearing the sizzle of all those onions and peppers cooking and you can smell the aroma, you know, throughout the whole dining room. Uh, and then it comes in and you taste it and it's all part of this uh, experience of flavor. Okay. Any other thoughts? Uh, I, I would add that when you consume real food and beverage, it's always a combination of different senses and, you know, uh, it's not only chemical senses. Uh, but as a scientist, when you taste the individual flavor molecules, that's when you get sometimes pure taste or pure smell. Um, so, but most consumers don't do that. Okay, so um, there was a question about um, flavor science. When, when did it start? And I thought I would just comment on that. So in a way, technology preceded science. Um, spices and essential oils were traded by ancient Egyptians. And in the 11th century, it was discovered in Persia that steam distillation could be used to generate essential oils from many different plant species. And so there was a big trade in spice and essential oils that became a major component of commerce. And remember that Columbus discovered America on a mission to discover a shorter route for the spice trade with the East. So um, a lot of flavor components were natural. In fact, all flavor components were natural until German companies began making derivatives to address supply sort shortages as, for example, artificial vanilla in the 19th and 20th century. And this triggered a lot of structure activity studies uh, conducted on flavor, uh, especially taste by flavor companies. And then taste buds were discovered in the 19th century, but the actual taste receptors weren't identified and cloned until 1999 by Charles Zucker and Nick Reba at UCSD and NIH. And that followed the discovery of the first olfactory receptors, and there are hundreds of them, uh, discovered in 1991 by Linda Buck and Richard Axel at Columbia University. And they won the Nobel Prize in 2004 in physiology and medicine for that work. So when we think about that scientific uh, basis or, or background, what's the molecular basis of flavor? How do we sense and process information about taste and, um, and smell? So Sheldon, you want to start as a molecular biologist? Uh, yeah, definitely. So if we go by the narrower definition of flavor, uh, just the taste and the smell, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, taste receptors and the olfactory receptors are the major mediators of uh, flavor perception. Taste receptors are located on the tongue in the taste bud. Um, there are only a few hundred uh, taste receptor cells in the taste buds. Uh, so when the taste buds are exposed, to flavor um, chemicals. They bind to the taste receptor, activate the taste receptor, and then uh, signal transduction happens in the taste receptor cell. The cell would be able to generate a signal and send to the brain. And the brain perceive the, uh, receive the signal and integrate all the information with other senses we talked about earlier and give you the perception of flavor. And similar story happens in the nose with olfactory receptors. So basically that's, that's the mechanism of flavor perception. And so these are genetically encoded, obviously. And so is it possible that somebody could have polymorphisms in taste receptors or olfactory receptors that would affect their perception of the same material in a different way that somebody else might? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, there are, uh, famous examples of prop taste. 
I think a lot of us have done this experiment when we were in middle school. PROP is a chemical that tastes extremely bitter to one third of the population. And another third of the population doesn't taste it at, at all. And uh, the remaining one third of the population is even between. And basically they taste the mild bitterness. So that is determined by polymorphism, which specific allele or variant of one bitter taste receptor gene you carry. So that is something you cannot change that comes with genetics. But with that said, um, the variation, the polymorphism in taste and uh, is, is very limited because this, it, it is such an important function of the, of the body. Very little polymorphism in sweet taste, umami taste, salty taste, or even sour taste. Maybe we don't know about uh, sour taste that much yet. Bitter taste is the, really the one that we are, uh, where people have a lot of polymorphism and differences that are well documented. In the olfactory receptors, there are also a lot of polymorphism, but uh, taste is rather uh, protected. So when we talk about flavors, we, we've been talking about flavors or, or taste components and as, you know, that are added to food and they come with their own flavors. Uh, but, but compounds are generated during cooking as well. And, and that changes certainly the flavor of a dish tremendously. So John, this is, there are companies now, Impossible is one of them, that's trying to use the cooking process and the composition of plant materials to mimic flavors. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Larry. Um, you know, so Impossible really uh, has taken an approach to deconstruct what we like about certain food dishes and then see whether or not we can replicate the, those elements um, through plant-based natural ingredients. And so, you know, one of the most important discoveries that was made early on before even I joined the company um, was the idea that one of the biggest flavor molecules in meat um, in red meat, for example, is a, a globin. It's a hemoglobin or myoglobin that is part of um, all of nature. In fact, it exists in, in plants in some form, and it exists, of course, in humans to carry oxygen as well as animals to carry oxygen. Well, that, that hemoglobin or myoglobin is very important because it contains a chemical um, molecule called hemoglobin. Um, heme, and it has a iron um, part of that, that chemistry. And so what happens during the cooking process is that the protein that holds on to this heme and iron um, unfolds and denatures to the point where um, now that flavor chemistry can be um, generated during the process of cooking. And so um, what, what we um, learned early on was that in order to make something taste very much like an animal uh, meat, like a hamburger, we had to put a natural plant version of that myoglobin called legume hemoglobin into our product and combine that with a protein source and a fat source that then mimic the elements that, that we love about a burger. And so our, our burger looks like it is just like ground beef. Um, it's red. And when you cook it, it transforms its color and it transforms its flavor to react with the molecules that are present in the proteins, as well as the sugars, as well as the lipids, to then create the flavors that we love when we grill a burger or we love when we grill a steak. And so our approach was to try to use that, that plant-based system to um, look at the positive side of flavor, but we also think of it in terms of the negative side of flavor. There are certain things that we don't like. I think both Sheldon and Vivek, uh, Vivek, Vivek have, have indicated, you know, some, some uh, folks can taste different spectrum, but when you, when you, you know, have a soybean, you can taste some oil, soybean off flavors, or you, if you have corn, you can, you can taste some of those as well. And so, Part of our process is to actually um, deconstruct both positive flavors that we like that are generated during cooking, but also to identify those flavors that we don't like, cardboard, must, oxidized lipids, things that 
just make you feel like, ugh, I don't want to eat this and, and try to eliminate those as well. So it's a very interesting biochemical and molecular experiment, but it's really about finding um, what we know and what we like about these elements. So that's a, that's a really interesting, you're describing a really interesting dynamic process where you're generating, you're generating flavors and uh, at some point they can be very pleasant if you go beyond in certain cooking, uh, too hot, whatever, too long, then they can become unpleasant. And I think that's actually true even of just simple flavor constituents. There are some thiol compounds that at very low levels have a, have a pleasant flavor, but as, as you increase the concentration, they become unpalatable. Uh, and so uh, it kind of hints at, at the differences between not only dose, but also whether they're natural or, uh, or synthetic. And, uh, you know, Sheldon, maybe you could answer for us, what's a, what's a natural flavor and what's a synthetic flavor? How are those classified differently? Yeah, that's a, a complex question. Uh, so if we take uh, the perspective of average consumers. Uh, synthetic, chemical, synthetic flavors are anything that is made in the lab, uh, not extracted from plants or food material. And natural are, you know, uh, the opposite and uh, they are only derived from the real food material. So that I would say that that's the definition from the average consumer perspective from, but from the industry perspective, it is a lot more complicated. So uh, if in the industry, a natural flavor could be, made, uh, could be made in the lab as long as it's found in nature and you use very mild um, chemical conditions to produce the flavor and you use uh, starting material that are natural. So there are some differences between uh, the consumer perception and the industry standard of natural and synthetic. I see. And so Vivek, when you're, when you're sourcing things for your restaurant, what, what sort of range of materials do you use? Yeah, uh, we always try to hit a balance. Um, of course, like with the tasting menu format, you have the opportunity to give people a number of dishes. Um, and so within that, we try to find um, what we call contrast in flavor, uh, as well as contrast in texture. Um, and so that is to say that when you eat a dish, we think about all of these elements that they're gonna hit as you taste them. So it's like, we want a dish to be um, a little bit sweet, a little bit salty, a little bit sour, a little bit bitter, have a little bit of umami as well. Um, and that's really also how we try to teach our cooks. And um, a lot of times people ask me like, how do you know if ingredients go together? Um, and really kind of like, that's the, those, uh, what you taste is kind of like your basic formula. Um, and so one example is like, you know, we make a lot of in Indian food, it's called dal. Uh, which is just a simple lentil soup. Um, and a lot of people around the country make it in different ways, but the way that we make it in the state of Gujarat, which is where my family comes from, is uh, we boil the lentils in water and then they're made a little salty with, with actual just salt, um, a little sweet with some jaggery. Um, it's a little sour with lime juice and it's a little bitter with fenugreek seeds. Uh, and every house makes theirs a little different and it's usually different based on one of those four areas. So some people might like it sweeter, so they might add more sugar. Some people might like it saltier. Some people might like it more bitter. Some people might like it spicy. Um, you know, you can change all those things um, in order to suit it to your taste. Um, but we try to give usually at the restaurant kind of a range of dishes um, that might start off more sour at the beginning uh, because sour really makes your mouth water. And so if you think like dishes like ceviche or raw food preparations, um, or salads that have vinaigrettes. Uh, these are things that kind of get your palate going. Um, and then you can introduce other elements uh, like salty or bitter a little bit later in the meal. You know, bitter being very famous at the, usually at the end uh, because most bitter ingredients are natural digestives as well. So uh, you're talking about modifying flavors and uh, so I'll, I'll throw this one out there. So uh, we talk a lot about wines complementing food. Sure, yep. And um, so how does that work? Do, do we understand that? Yeah, um, certainly I can tell it from a, a taste perspective, less from a science perspective. Uh, 
Um, but to me, I think um, the reason why wine can complement food so well um, is that as a um, acidic product, especially um, traditionally in French cooking, Italian cooking, uh, you have these very butter uh, cream laden sauces, uh, very rich cooking, uh, whether that might be, um, you know, lobster thermidor or, um, you know, Dover sole meunier, uh, or you have, you know, just kind of a, like a steak au poivre with these very rich um, dairy laden fatty sauces, um, that you have something that um, has a contrasting flavor profile or texture to it. Um, and so sometimes you go with these wines that have a little bit more acidity um, because just like how you could squeeze a lemon over one of those dishes um, to achieve some balance, um, you can also use the wine to achieve that balance as well. So um, speaking of flavor modification, this is kind of one of the, the frontiers of flavor science these days. Sheldon, do you want to comment a little bit on flavor modifiers, what they are and how they're discovered and marketed? Yeah, definitely. So flavor modifiers, they are a specific group of flavor ingredient um, which don't have a strong flavor of their own, um, but they can boost or suppress the perception of other flavors, uh, other basic taste. So actually our startup company, Xora Scientific, is specifically focusing on this area. Uh, we are trying to develop flavor modifiers from plants and most of the plants are from, you know, are actually food material. So the flavor modifiers really started uh, in the early 2000 uh, when uh, Synomics get into the field. At the beginning, they were looking for traditional flavors, but uh, later on, it turned out the flavor modifiers can give you uh, much better uh, impact and uh, the benefit of those molecules is that they don't really have a strong flavor of their own. So they don't really introduce um, off taste of their own. So they're mostly used for sugar, salt, fat reduction, and also um, used for masking the off taste of a healthy food ingredient that uh, John touched upon. Uh, those ingredients include plant proteins, whole grains, uh, vitamins and other functional ingredient. So it, it is the uh, cutting edge in the traditional flavor industry. So um, you actually, you mentioned uh, drug discovery approaches to, <clears throat> to, to try to discover these. Could you briefly touch on what you mean by that? What yeah, uh, drug discovery approaches are? Yeah, definitely. So the pharma approach is basically uh, they, they find a receptor target for certain disease and uh, they perform high throughput screening. They build, build a cell-based assay using the receptor as a reporter to see you know, what compound, what chemical is activating the receptor, what chemical is uh, uh, deactivating the receptor, et cetera. So uh, that's the pharma approach to find new drugs. Uh, at Synomics, uh, what uh, we did was we cloned the human taste receptor, build a cell-based assay and performed high throughput screening to find chemicals that modulate the activity of taste receptors. And those, are, uh, those become uh, taste modifiers and they fall into the group of flavors instead of pharmaceuticals. But the basic research approach are exactly the same. So taste on a chip. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, speaking of taste, we've had we had a question in the reg during registration. We've had four questions uh, today that I think uh, in the box that really touch on something that's a concern for everybody during the pandemic, and that is that uh, it's well known that one of the the hallmarks of COVID infection is a loss of taste and smell in individuals um, in a significant number of people. In fact, a couple of years ago when I got a cold and I thought it might be COVID, I ran into the, out onto my deck and grabbed a bay leaf, and, or I'm sorry, a uh, basil leaf and um, uh, scored it and then I could still smell it. So I felt like I was okay. It was my, my biomarker. But it's a serious problem, and especially in, in long COVID. 
So do we know how um, the coronavirus infection affects taste and flavor? Um, I'm opening this up for, for anyone. Well, I, I can give my opinion. Um, there is no um, science that, uh, that demonstrated the mechanism yet, um, but there, there has been a lot of uh, speculations how this is happening. Um, definitely the COVID virus can attack the nervous system. I think, you know, the taste and the olfactory tissues are really the frontier um, in terms of uh, um, uh, virus exposure because the virus started to replicate and accumulate um, in the respiratory tract and taste and, and smell tissues are exposed first and exposed for much longer time. Yeah, I, I actually uh, did a Google search over the weekend on this. And um, it, there is one study that was performed about a year ago that, that demonstrates, fortunately, that, the, that uh, olfactory neurons don't express the ACE2 receptor, which mm -hmm. is the, the target for coronavirus uptake by the spike protein. And, um, but it is taken up, or it, is, it does infect the cystentacular cells, which are the support cells that surround the neurons. So somehow infection of those supporting cells then affects the uh, performance of the olfactory neurons. Uh, and that was important because I guess there was some fear that the virus could infect through the, the nasal passage if it infected neurons could get directly into the brain. Yeah, but in fact, the virus particles are very, very low in, in most human brain, at least in autopsy samples and in CSF. But, but there's still a lot to learn there that we don't understand. I, I'm sorry to monopolize that if somebody else wants to jump in uh, with thoughts. Okay. So uh, speaking of toxicity, uh, what, what do we know about the safety of of flavors. Uh, you know, we worry a lot about the safety of food. The, the Food and Drug Administration has that as their remit. So um, are flavors for the most part safe uh, or are there flavors that we should be concerned about? And, and how do we know that? Well, um... I'm not just saying this because I work in the industry, <laughs> but uh, I, I think uh, the safety concerns with flavors are uh, very low, and, but they are often exaggerated in the social media. Um, I say this for two reasons. First, majority, the vast majority of uh, flavor chemicals are actually found in nature, found in food. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, Larry, they are self-limiting in terms of use level. Um, you use too much, they're not pleasant anymore. Um, so the perception, you know, of, of flavors, um, chemicals, and, you know, if you purely look at it from a chemical structure, they could be uh, scary sometimes, but uh, the use level are really at the low PPM level, and they are often present in the real food material you consume every day. Um, in terms of... Uh, approval and the regulatory. Um, the flavor industry has in independent uh, expert panel of toxicologists reviewing and approving new ingredient every year. And uh, Larry, you are very familiar with this. Um, of course, I agree. Uh, the artificial flavor chemicals not found in nature, uh, you don't normally consume. Uh, those uh, would require much more safety data before they can be pr uh, approved. Yeah, I'll just chime in. You know, uh, one of the things that's very important is the nutrition, health, and safety uh, at a company like Impossible Foods. Um, and we have an extensive group that, that uses outside as well as internal um, safety um, analyses. But, you know, flavor as, as been, has been described is, is one, the, so much of what we have in food comes from the plant-based world. And if you think about it, there are tens of thousands of different um, varieties uh, to which we can get spices. Or if you think about the soybean, for example, there are actually 10,000 varieties of soybean on the planet. So 
that diversity in nature is something that um, is really uh, being tapped into in a very safe way um, to, to identify things that we might like. It was interesting to me to learn that realistically, if you put a bunch of flavors into a dish, um, how many can one perceive is really uh, part of a debate, right? And there's some that would say you can discriminate maybe five different flavors, others that have a very sophisticated palate, or if you think about the wine industry, a sommelier must be able to, to sample and, and discriminate more than, than five. But you know, we can try to also keep it very simple. Um, and that's something that's an important approach, um, I think, as we try to use plant-based um, uh, approaches to um, replacing things that we know and love. The other side of it is, you know, flavors in things that we consider, like, for example, in, in steak, you know, there's some things in there that we really don't want to consume, for example, cholesterol and various other components. So not only is there a flavor issue for safety, but there's a health issue that is something that science has played a big role and medicine has played a big role in. So I think that as we consider flavor and how we perceive it, we also want to consider the nutrition um, and health and, and safety of that in a delicious component. You, you kind of touched on this, John, actually, but a question from the audience. Um, do you have professional tasters uh, in your company who have very finely tuned taste abilities? Did they take training to get into that profession or were they just born with that ability? Um, yes, actually, it is something that's trained. Um, you know, in order to uh, expedite and to really get an unbiased approach, we use a combination of, of tasters from within the company, but mostly from outside sources so that it's done double blinded, that no one knows which one is the, you know, if we're comparing a burger to one of our plant-based meats, um, you know, we, we use those external tasters to um, come up with the discriminatory power and we train them on soy off flavor roasted or lipid oxidation and various other components as a way to really quantify you know if we're moving the needle because we're sampling we're reformulating we're doing all this experimentation that is trying to find that sweet spot or not in the sweet sense but just the the ideal um, combination and and you can imagine that's a very um, large uh, number of possibilities. The other thing is, is that, you know, um, for example, just recently we launched uh, a, a chicken uh, nugget and we compared the chicken nuggets that are from Impossible that are made from all, all plant-based ingredients to chicken nuggets made um, by one of the leading uh, manufacturers of, of animal-based chicken nuggets. And we got results back that indicated that people had a preference for even impossible over that. And so that, that tells you how important it can be, at least from a perspective of trying to change an incumbent industry, that we have to be competitive and what we have to know what people really want in that, not only from the taste factor, but also from the nutrition. So the fact that we're able to actually use plant-based ingredients to recapitulate something like chicken or sausage or beef and approximate the animal is something that the, uh, the tasters have really helped us uh, achieve. It's a really important component. So this, and this is kind of relates to a couple questions that we've gotten, which is whether uh, tastes evolve as, as we age. Um, can we delve more into how our tastes evolve over time and we get a taste for more sophisticated foods as we get older? Whereas as kids, uh, we're content with chicken nuggets and macaroni and cheese all day. So Vivek, do you, you want to take a shot at that one? Yeah, sure. Um, I think definitely from an experience standpoint, um, you know, it's like when you're a kid, uh, you, I feel like I always wanted things that were maybe a little sweeter, you know, whether that was, you know, candy or, or fruit, uh, ice cream, you know, those kinds of things. And um, I think you start developing um, your understanding of food, you know, it's like, you know, Hey, something's bland. Like, let me add a little salt to that. Right. Or, Hey, this thing is really, um, you know, it's like, if you're eating like fried food or something, it's like, Oh, maybe I want to squeeze a lemon or like dip my fish and chips in some malt vinegar or something like that. 
Um, you might even be like, hey, like, I want my food to be spicier. So it's like on my pizza, I'm going to put red pepper flakes. Um, and I think really it's just a matter of you develop the more different things you try, right? So for example, if you grew up and all you ate was, you know, pizza and burgers and that kind of stuff. And then let's say you went to college and you met some friends who introduced you to Vietnamese food or Thai food, right? Then you start learning that there's all these different flavors that you can have, all different balances. Whereas, you know, I think sometimes, um, you know, Thai food specifically for me, that was always a game changer because it's one of those cuisines where you really do taste all flavor, all taste, right? You get sweet, sour, salty, bitter, you get all that in Thai food. And to me, the first time I had it, I was just hooked uh, because it activated all those things. Um, and then I think, you know, as, as you start developing and the more you taste, um, then the, um, more broad your palate is, um, and the more you can enjoy things, it also gives you a little bit of perspective. Um, and um, I also think there's a skill in, you know, kind of what John was alluding to earlier, there's also a skill sometimes in taste with the skill of recall. Um, and so a lot of times people will eat something and they'll say, I know exactly what this is, but they won't be able to name it. Um, and I think that's where, you know, it's like professionally tasting in kitchens or definitely people who are sommeliers, they have that skill of being able to smell something or taste something and say, hey, that is, you know, raspberry, um, cedar, and, um, you know, I don't know, <laughs> uh, raspberry, cedar, and maybe like lemon, you know, that you're able to recall those flavors. And I think that's just a matter of practice and time and training um, that allows you to be able to taste more things and then recall what those tastes are. In including remembering where you were when you first tasted it. That's right, yeah. Or smelled it. Well, that may be influenced heavily by whether Vivek uh, serves uh, the wine pairing or whether you just have <laughs> sparkling water that evening. That's right. Now, there is somebody- That's what your phones are for, yeah. One of our, one of our uh, attendees said that they, in capital letters, they would like to speak in favor of macaroni and cheese. So, <laughs> happy about that. Uh, so, um, Sheldon, with regard to uh, flavor constituents, you know, we're, we've been talking about food, but flavoring flavorants are used in other products uh, that are not foods or related to foods. Could you maybe expand our horizons a little bit on where where these compounds are used? Uh, yeah, so the most notorious example is uh, tobacco. The tobacco industry actually uses a lot of flavors, um, but uh, the, the uh, major leading flavor houses uh, all pretty much all publicly announced that uh, they don't do business with the uh, with the tobacco industry. And uh, nowadays, the, the vaping industry use a lot of flavors. It's, uh, you know, it's mainly flavors, actually flavor plus nicotine. Um, uh, hot, hard salsa, uh, right now, uh, a lot of those materials, they are considered food and beverage product, um, but they use a lot of flavor too. But you, you know, you, I don't personally consider them as traditional food and, and beverage, but those are, those are several examples where flavors are widely used. So is in the case of hard seltzer, is, um, is that a case where you, basically the flavor is manufactured by the, the flavorist at the company who's adding the different materials to the liquid, to the water and the alcohol? Yeah, the flavor industry provide uh, the different uh, profiles of flavor um, that are used in hard, hard seltzer and uh, the were added at the manufacturing side of the beverage companies. But please don't tell me that that happens at uh, scotch or bourbon distilleries, but that in fact, those are really natural flavors that are coming from the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you are safe there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in, in the traditional uh, in, uh, alcohol um, industry, there are regulations in beer, you cannot really add, uh, you know, uh, flavors and in scotch wines and all those other things traditional uh, alcoholic beverages uh, you cannot really add uh, flavors to it but when it gets to spirit and when you're mixing a lot of things then you know uh, flavor molecules does get in 
So, so one flavor that, that or actually an aroma that, you know, reminds me of, of my days on the expert panel for the Flavor and Extract Manufacturers Association is biacetyl, which is the, is the aroma component of butter. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's added to buttered popcorn. Yeah. And so it's, it's an unusual odor constituent because its dose response is linear. So you can actually go to higher and higher concentrations before it really becomes unpleasant. And so you can, uh, the, the butter, butter flavor of popcorn can get really intense by just adding more biacetyl in. And I think, isn't this a butter, the butter constituent of Chardonnay's as well, this malolactic fermentation that gives biacetyl? I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, I'm not sure either, um, but a diacetyl is actually found in a wide range of uh, food and the beverage product and they, they were produced naturally. Um, if, you, if you control the use level and don't uh, use high, highly concentrated diacetyl, which is unpleasant anyway, um, it, is, it is a safe molecule to use. Now the industry is moving away from diacetyl mainly because of the manufacturing hassle. Uh, you have to generate large quantity at high concentration. The safety of the workers is really at the concern. It is not, you know, um, at the consumer level, a very low level of diacetyl doesn't do anybody harm. Right, good. Um, so how does consumer preference drive the flavor industry? And, and each of you represents a different component of the flavor industry, Vivac, you, you are the flavor industry really right out there at, at the closest to the consumer, but um, maybe each of you could comment from your perspective on that. Sure. Um, I think, you know, for us as a restaurant, we just want to make sure that um, people have a great meal. Um, and so um, we try to do things that um, we know uh, you know, we're not using weird flavor combinations or anything like that. You know, this is a, uh, we're a restaurant that really focuses on, uh, like I said, South Asian American food. So a lot of our recipes come from uh, the traditional Indian dishes that I grew up eating um, in the place that we now call home. Um, and so um, more of it's probably for us driven by what are the best products that we can get at any given time. Um, and so we change our menu, you know, every three months. So it's pretty much every season. Um, and we, you know, we know during summer that there's certain things that we always want to have, uh, whether that's like watermelon or corn or summer tomatoes and beans. Um, and we know that as the seasons involve, we'll have um, different ingredients that, that we want to um, showcase um, or it's um, cool ingredients that some of our, um, our partners are growing um, or it's really great spices that we have access to. Um, but for us, I mean, the, for the customer, we're always trying to make things that are gonna taste delicious, that are gonna have good contrast of flavor, that are gonna have good contrast of texture, um, and hopefully together create a memorable dining experience. Okay, John, you, you touched on this a little bit with regard to impossible and um, consumer preference. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I will say that uh, we very much care what the consumer uh, thinks about our product. And there's definitely, for those that have tried plant-based meats, there is a bias that is in there that many people have had some plant-based products and just think they're, they're awful. And we have to, to overcome that by making something that's even better. So we, we definitely pay attention to what the consumer wants. We use these tasters. We also think about um, what, what folks uh, that come into Impossible, we have a, a number of employees that way that will do those tastes. But I will say this, that, you know, back in the early 1900s, when um, folks asked uh, people what they wanted, and, and this is the little dig against the consumer themselves, is that they would have said they needed a faster horse, not, not a, a, a car, right? So we, we also want to be very mindful that as we um, go through this process and find the most nutritious and, and balanced uh, approaches to this, that we, we actually um, give the consumer something that they didn't even expect. And, and that's, that's a, a very important goal 
um, as we think about all the different things that have been raised in the chat, I mean, do we, do we, can we train our preferences? Um, do we, you know, I hated cilantro when I was a kid, lima beans too, but now I, I love both of them, you know? So yeah, I, I feel like um, the consumer has a very big impact and role, but we also want to um, um, come up with things that uh, actually um, impress the consumer beyond, because we have that ability, you know, the animal stopped evolving uh, in that capacity for us. We, we are limit, unlimited in that. And same with the Vakes, you know, ingredient list. He can put so many different spices together to create a dish that nobody even imagined. I've been there, I've tasted it, and I'm just blown away by that complexity. So, you know, that invention is also something that as long as we can scale it, there's been a number of things in the chat, you know, for a plant-based mission-based company, we have to get something that's affordable and scalable to replace this incumbent industry that is so destructive to our planet. So we do have some limitations as to what protein sources and what sources of ingredients and flavor that we can use. Um, and I know there was a couple of questions related to, um, you know, allergens in that, and I'll address those in the, in the chat room. But yeah, consumers play a big role, but we also want to educate and, and open the eyes of consumers. Okay, Sheldon, any thoughts? Uh, for the flavor industry, consumer preference is the king. Uh, it is the number one factor uh, on their mind. Um, so they care about their bottom line and the bottom line is basically revenue minus cost and uh, revenue is driven by consumer preference. And even though the flavor industry are not um, B2C companies, they are B2B, but they spend significant resources following the consumer preference, uh, which is constantly changing. Um, so it is, it is the key. Actually, the food and beverage industry sometimes consult with flavor industry in terms of consumer trend, new consumer trend. That is an interesting fact I have seen. So we don't typically do marriage counseling in these lab to table conversations. But one of the questions is, my husband does not eat red meat. It is not a choice for him. Uh, by the way, this does not seem like a major problem between husband and wife, but uh, it's not a choice for him. He's been that way since childhood. The smell and taste of red meat is very repulsive to him. Is this just an oddity on his part, like the fact that I can't stand black licorice, or is there some specific condition that renders red meat repulsive to some? Well, I'll, I'll just chime in. There's, there's a number of things that are components of our, our molecular makeup. And just like we react differently to molecules that we use to treat disease, um, different uh, food substances uh, create a very polarizing, negatively reinforced effect. And that can be explained, in, in, as Sheldon was pointing out earlier and Larry, about the, the molecular bases of taste and flavor. And so depending on how your system may be wired, um, the same molecule may have a very negative effect, whereas for much of the population, it has a, a very positive effect. I go back to, you know, cilantro tasted very soapy to me. So perhaps, um, you know, I was in that camp. And as Sheldon mentioned, when we were all in elementary school, we had to taste the, the little molecule, or if you use the restroom after having asparagus, um, you know, some people can um, smell things that the metabolite of the process. Uh, so, you know, that natural variation is something that's part of our population. Um, I don't think it's something intrinsic to red meat, but it, it could have been something that's um, at a neurologic or a, a molecular level. So it's a good, good question. Good call out. Uh, Sheldon, did you, you look like you were about to say something. Yeah, I, I just want to add uh, to it that um, uh, genetics, molecular basis is, is one important factor, uh, as John mentioned, uh, but also learned preference is, uh, uh, is also important. Uh, a lot of times psychological factors can change your preference. I know examples where people uh, who loves red meat before um, but they turn vegetarian for uh, environmental reasons. 
and later on after after a certain period of time and they could not stand the smell of red meat anymore and there are also examples where people were vegetarian and they don't eat meat at all but through exposure uh, and they tend to meet lovers. So there are a lot of plasticity in terms of taste preference. I apologize, my, my dog insists on joining the call. <laughs> this isn't the first time that's happened in the last two years, okay. so welcome. Um, there's a question in the box. Uh, do synthetic flavors fake out the sense of satiety? Is it possible that they are leading to eating problems that lead to obesity? Sheldon, you want to take a shot at that? Sure. Uh, that is a very uh, deep scientific question. Uh, I, I'm really glad to see a question like that. A couple of years ago, there was a public publication in Nature uh, showing that uh, artificial sweeteners um, can actually change uh, the composition of uh, microbiome in the gut. And actually, uh, they are associated with um, statistics in terms of obesity and, uh, and uh, diabe diabetes. So satiety is a very, very compli complicated mechanism. Uh, when, you, when your body consumes something sweet, for example, uh, it anticipates sugar and insulin start to secret even before the sugar reach the blood. So if you train your body that way, constantly trick it with something sweet, without giving it sugar, the body is going to adapt. Uh, now, I don't know the consequences of that, but I don't think it is pure correlation between consumption of uh, artificial sweeteners um, and diabetes and obesity. Yeah, but, but it does illustrate the complexity of these systems. And, and in fact, the, the existence of taste receptors on cells in the gut, they're not just in the tongue. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's a sort of a sentinel for exposure, right? Right, yeah. So uh, as you can imagine, the body needs to very carefully regulate um, the nutrients and, and, and the energy level and in terms of storage, consumption, et cetera. Okay, so um, what's the economic impact of the substitution of artificial for natural? or synthetic for natural. And, in, and maybe the reverse of that is, do consumers, um, will consumers tolerate the term synthetic flavor today? Uh, sorry, Larry, uh, I need you to uh, repeat the question a little oh. bit. I love the first yeah, part. so it's basically um, consumers seem to, prefer natural for sure, will they even tolerate synthetic, the, the perception that a flavor is synthetic? Uh, I, would, I would say no. Um, you know, if the consumer can uh, have, a, have a choice, they will always choose real food and no added flavor at all. Um, but uh, I think flavor molecules are important actually for uh, increasing the palatability of a lot of the healthy food ingredients. And also from a sustainability perspective, uh, you cannot gen generate everything through um, real food and expect to feed the growing population. Okay, so last question real quick for each of you. Um, uh, what's the best unusual flavor combinations for each of you? Uh, this is this is really well. I, I'll I'll cold. start because I'll have the the simplest minded answer. I mean, it's texture, it's flavor, it's the experience of how it feels in one's mouth. So to me, it is that, uh, and it's also who you're with when you're eating a meal. So, yep. so many different aspects of neuroscience go into that, not just flavor. So, favorite combinations of unusual flavors? Anybody? Vivek, surely you've thought about yep. this. Well, you know, it's the, the unusual part of the question uh, is what's kind of thrown me off because I think that um, really it's just kind of what you're, what you're exposed to. Um, but I would say, you know, things that I thought were unusual when I was a kid, 
um, was always when we'd go to birthday parties and it was ice cream and potato chips. And it's like, I feel like that was kind of one of those pivotal moments where um, I was blending sweet and salty at the same time uh, from two things that you're not supposed to have together uh, that then are put in. And, um, and it's like, I think, you know, later as we get on, as we get older and, um, you know, the food becomes a little bit more playful. Um, I think it's kind of fun to go revert back to those old memories um, that a lot of people share. So I'll go with, I'll go with ice cream and potato chips. Sheldon, <laughs> any thoughts? Uh, the craziest thing I have ever tasted together is also ice cream, but with bacon crumbs in it. It actually tastes pretty good. <laughs> with, with what in it? Bacon crumb. Well, of course, bacon is the perfect food. <laughs> that's right. John, when is impossible going to replace bacon? No, that's uh, that's a very good question. And, uh, you know, I could tell you, but then I'd have to, you know, uh, remove the audience from the earth. But let's just say, if you can imagine it, we're working on it. And I was thinking about it, you know, not like peanut butter and chocolate, but like voodoo donuts and in um and portland has you know bacon and maple syrup chicken and waffles there's all kinds of things that go together that nobody would have ever imagined but somehow they make they a taste beer good. yeah they make beer with some of those donuts yeah well like i'll tell you the what the brewery and voodoo donuts yeah. the, <laughs> the invention capability of the human um mind is just amazing and so uh well, I think I'm coming, very adventurous. We're coming near the end of the, the uh, hour, and I want to thank you all. This has been really fun, and I hope informative for the audience. We've touched on a lot of different topics here. So, uh, Aaron, how are we doing? Are we getting close? Yes, we are at one hour. Okay, so that means we're going to disappear at some point here. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, we will see you at our next one. Uh, thank you all for joining. Thanks everyone. All right, thanks, thanks everyone. Bye, thanks, everybody. Everybody. Bye. Thank you.